Welcome to episode 314 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to, once again, retired agent Julia Cowley, who served in the FBI for 22 years. In this episode, she reviews the murder investigation of 13-year-old Tyler Pascal Placker and her 11-year-old friend Skylar Whitaker. Their bodies were discovered on a rural dirt road in Willica, Oklahoma. Julia prepared the detailed BAU analysis conducted to provide insight for investigators about the unknown subject who had shot and killed the girls. The investigators eventually identified the offender responsible for the murders, and he is now serving life in prison. After joining the FBI, Julia's first assignment was to the Boston Division, where she investigated white-collar crime, public corruption, and civil rights matters. Julia was then selected to join the FBI's Elite Behavioral Analysis Unit, BAU, in Quantico, Virginia. Julia's time in the BAU was followed by her selection to the FBI Laboratory Evidence Response Team Unit. She later returned to the Boston Division Springfield Resident Agency, where, until her retirement, she oversaw all federal criminal investigations in western Massachusetts, including public corruption, civil rights, white-collar crime, organized crime, gangs, and crimes against children. Julia is the host of The Consult, a true crime podcast where she and former BAU colleagues examine behaviors exhibited before, during, and after the commission of a criminal act. Now, before we get to the case review, I have some exciting news to share. On Sunday, April 28th, 2024, I am hosting FBI Retired Case File Review Live. The podcast meetup will be held at the Punchline Comedy Club in Philadelphia. The event is free and will run from 1130 a.m. until 2 p.m. Plenty of time to mingle, review a Philadelphia case live, and moderate an Ask Us Anything Q&A panel with me and former FBI retired case file review guest. If you have been a guest on this podcast, this is your official invitation to take part in the meetup. For more information about FBI Retired Case File Review Live in your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link for my website where you'll find everything you need to know about this live event. I'll be bringing lots of podcast stickers and FBI swag to give away. One more thing, my April Reader Team email should be in your inbox. There's information about the meetup in the newsletter. This month, I review Twin Peaks for teachable moments about FBI policy and procedures. Thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, retired agent Julia Cowley. Hey, Julia, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm great. And I know that your podcast, The Consult, is doing great too because I listen to it all the time and catch all the new episodes that you have coming out. As I've always told you, I think it's a unique premise and format. Why don't you tell everybody who doesn't know about The Consult what your podcast is about? Sure. I am the host and I do the podcast most of the time with three other retired FBI profilers. My co-hosts are Angela Cercer, Susan Costler Drew, and Bob Drew. We talk about cases from a behavioral perspective, solved cases and unsolved cases. It's like being in the room with the FBI's BAU. It's as close as it gets. And it is absolutely fantastic. Now, you were on this show before. You were on episode 242, where you talked about the behavioral analysis you did for Joseph D'Angelo, also known as the Golden State Killer and the East Area Rapist. What I want to know is, did you have an opportunity 
not that I want to put you on the spot, to listen to the episode that I did about the DNA and the genetic genealogy. Yes. Is that the episode that you did with the general counsel? Yes, with yep. Steve Kramer. That was episode one of that two-parter. And he talked about what he did to help identify possibilities of who the Golden State Killer might be through genetic matching. And I thought the reason I also bring it up is because you both talked about the same case, but it's really how you describe behavioral analysis, that it doesn't actually solve the case, but it helps narrow down possibilities of who may have been responsible. Right. That's exactly right. The way they solved that case was groundbreaking, as we know now. I remember when I was back on your show almost three years ago, and you had asked, how did it help? And I've since learned that the linkage analysis that I had done linking the Golden State Killer to the Visalia Ransacker, those series was actually very helpful in tracing the killer's whereabouts. And it gave them another set of data points. And I learned that because there had been a study done on the profile by a professor at the University of Texas. And I found out much later, the profile was actually very helpful. And the investigators had said they would have gotten to him eventually, but the profile helped to get to him more quickly. So that was fascinating to hear that. Yeah, that must have been very satisfying and validating to learn that. Right. All right. Well, today I have you back to talk about another case. Now, I know you have done an episode, matter of fact, two episodes, part one and part two, on this case on your podcast, and I will link to that in the show notes. But I thought we would come back here and discuss it, not just the analysis that you did, but really kind of look at the case from all angles, including what the local police did, what the local FBI did, Just learn as much as we can about this case, which is always so sad to discuss a case that involves the murder of children. Right. It's extremely sad. All right. So why don't you go ahead and give us a brief introduction to what we'll be talking about, and then we'll start wherever you want to start. This case began on Sunday, June 8th of 2008, between the hours of 4.30 p.m. and 4.45 p.m., and it involved Taylor Pascal Placker, who was 13 at the time, and her best friend Skyla Whitaker, who was 11. They were both shot to death while walking along a rural country road in Waleka, Oklahoma, and it was called County Line Road, and it was a dirt road. Just to set the stage, Walika is in Ofusky County, which is approximately 69 miles south of Tulsa and 89 miles west of Oklahoma City. Walika is very small. I think at the time it had a population of about 1,000. I don't know the exact number, but as you can see, it's very small. This case made national news. And at the time, I remember reading about it and following it and wondering to myself, what kind of person could do such a thing? Yeah, it is just really unbelievable, especially the fact that they were shot and multiple times. Multiple times. And the information that was coming out was that they had been shot with two different weapons. And it wasn't clear if one had been shot. I don't recall if this had come out, but if one had been shot with just one weapon and another one shot with another weapon, or they'd both been shot with two different weapons. It just wasn't clear at the time, but that was the information. They were putting out flyers with composite sketches of a stranger that had been seen in the area. And that was the initial information that came out. It wasn't a lot, but it was a case that just grabbed my attention and kept it for many years. To this day, I continue to think about it, and it was an extremely meaningful case to me for a number of reasons. Do you recall if the area had ever experienced such a type of violence before? I mean, you would think in a small town like that, very seldom were there any type of murders or anything like this. Was this the type of anomaly I think it is? 
Yes. There was nothing else similar that had occurred in this area. I mean, in this area, there were typical problems, vandalism, drugs, domestic violence, but nothing like this and nothing that targeted seemingly completely innocent victims. This was one of the biggest investigations that the state of Oklahoma had ever encountered. Before you talk about how you got involved, could you talk a little bit about the FBI's involvement? Because usually in a type of murder case, the FBI is not called. I would imagine because these were young girls, they were 11 and 13, did you say? Yes. That that probably would encourage local police to reach out to get as much help as possible. But could you talk about what the FBI's involvement was from the very beginning? Well, early on, I don't think that there was a lot of involvement with the FBI. Certainly, they were notified. And the FBI, as you know, always offers any kind of assistance necessary. But they have to be invited in because this is a homicide. It's a local homicide. The FBI doesn't have jurisdiction. The state and locals have the jurisdiction. But as the investigation grew, there became leads to cover that were out of state and tracing weapons and things like that. So that's where the FBI became involved and the local resident agency there, which was Muskogee, the Muskogee resident agency provided assistance. And there was an FBI agent in the RA that covered a lot of those leads for the state and locals. And that was the assistance. And then of course, when they wanted the FBI's behavioral analysis unit involved, it's also that person locally who's responsible for the liaison between the state and local authorities and the FBI's BAU. So when I became involved in the case, to me, I was working alongside the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation agent, the lead investigator, as well as the local FBI agent who was in the Muskogee RA. Now, I recall you telling me about this case and your interest in this case way before you even joined the BAU. So tell me about that. Well, I think the age of the victims struck me. And I also grew up in a rural area. I lived on a dirt road. I'd go out for runs and walks so I could relate. And I just couldn't have imagined the area where I grew up and lived and felt so safe to just be walking down the road and somebody comes by and shoots you. I just found that compelling and I was drawn to it because of that. And I just followed it. Following it would mean I would look on the internet to see if there'd been any developments. Certainly at the beginning, I was looking almost daily. And then as time went on, I just maybe check every week. And then it became like every few months. Then by the time I was in the FBI's BAU, I was in training. And the training consists of doing four months of classroom work. And then after that, you spend about a year to two years working alongside trained profilers in an apprenticeship. And you have to work cases in each of the units. And I was assigned to the Crimes Against Adults unit but I was required to work cases in the other units, which included the Crimes Against Children's unit. And one day I just happened to search the case to see if there had been any updates. And I found a news report that the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation, OSBI, was going to be requesting assistance from the FBI and specifically request assistance from the FBI's BAU. And I still needed to do a case or two in that unit. And so I thought, oh, I want to work on this case. So I requested that the case be assigned to me as one of my training cases, and they gave it to me. So it was surreal to be in a unit. And it's kind of, it was the same thing with the case of the Golden State Killer. It was a case I had followed and never in my wildest dreams did I think it would be me to be the person to figure out what kind of person can do this. So it's a little bit surreal when it was assigned to me. So that's how I got involved. I basically just asked. Sometimes that's how you get involved in things. You ask to be assigned and they gave it to me. And I thought it was a good case for me in terms of the type of crime and how it unfolded because a lot of the cases in the Crimes Against Children unit were child exploitation cases, which wasn't necessarily my strong suit, but I had a lot of experience 
I had been a former forensic scientist and I had been on the evidence response team. And this case, at least on the surface at the time, appeared to be a more traditional type of homicide that I was used to working or similar types of cases that we worked in the Crimes Against Adults unit. It's just that these victims happened to be underage. So I thought this was a good case because there was a lot of forensics for me to take a look at. And that was my background. And it was a more traditional type of homicide side case. Although we didn't mention it specifically, when you were talking about usually in that unit, it was child exploitation cases. What was different about this case was that these were young girls and they had not been sexually assaulted. That is correct. That came out through the autopsy and subsequent lab tests that there had been no sexual assault. It didn't appear there had been any sexual assault, even initial responders to the crime scene. That is unusual for this unit. What could be the motive then if it didn't appear, at least on the surface, to be sexually motivated? What could possibly be the motive for this? That was also very perplexing to me and to the other investigators that worked on this. Before we get into your analysis, I just have a few other questions, kind of getting an understanding of what happened before and also what motivated them to want to refer it to the BAU. The crime occurred in June of 2008. When was this referred to behavioral analysis? It was referred in December of 2010, but I don't think I actually started working on it until January of 2011, just based on different things, holidays and stuff like that. So really January of 2011 is when I started to look at it. I think what motivated OSBI to refer it was that they had done an extensive investigation and a very good, thorough investigation. I think they just thought, why don't we try profilers and see what they have to say? What do we have to lose? And of course, that goes back to the FBI agents that work with the state and locals and liaison with them let them know services that can be provided and are available to them in these types of cases. I think they just came to the point where we're not generating additional leads. And so perhaps having profilers take a look at this case, maybe that will give us a fresh perspective. And I think that's the one thing that I've learned from speaking with you and other profilers on the show is that the type of cases that are referred are ones that appear to be, at least at that stage of the investigation, unsolvable. They've tried everything they could, and they're not coming up with anything. And so they want, I guess you'd say, fresh eyes to look at it. Right. The purpose of doing this type of analysis, and I I think I mentioned this on the previous episode when I spoke with you, is profiling doesn't solve the case and it doesn't identify an offender, but it can help with investigative strategies. It can help clarify things with crime scene dynamics, motive. It is a fresh set of eyes in a set of unbiased eyes. When you've been involved in an investigation for a number of years and people develop their theories and it can be very difficult to step away from that. So it's nice to have someone from the completely in the outside who is unbiased, take a look at something and just provide a new perspective and maybe some new ideas. And that's what I think the OSBI was looking for at this point in their investigation. Before we dive deep into what you came up with in your analysis, my next question is, did they have an idea? Were they thinking that it might be somebody local or they were thinking it's a stranger passing through town? Did they at least have an idea? Did they have any usual suspects? They did not. And there were differing opinions. Several investigators had been assigned to this case at one point or another over the three years. They were all still assigned when I got involved, but they had difference of opinion. Some people thought this had to be a stranger that came in and did this. Other people thought definitely no way that it has to be a local. The other question was, was it one or two shooters because the use of multiple weapons? 
That was a question that needed to be answered. And they didn't really have any strong suspects. And I, I think that was helpful because nobody had tunnel vision in terms of this person did it and I'm not going to give up until we get that person. I, I don't think they really had any strong suspects at the time that this was brought to me. At least nobody ever told me, this is our guy. This is who I think did it. There really hadn't been anyone, anyone that they had investigated thoroughly, they were able to rule them out. All right. So it is January of 2011. You right. are assigned this case and you're going to begin working on it. What are the first steps that you take? First of all, I wanted to look at this, as I have already said, I wasn't looking to identify an offender or solve the case. When I approach a case, I think, okay, what questions do I need to try to answer for investigators? What do I need to clarify for them? Some of the things that were coming to mind, as I've already mentioned, because the use of two guns, were there one or two shooters? There was a very strong difference of opinion amongst investigators. So I thought that was a question I wanted to try to answer. Motive. Were these victims targeted? Was this planned or was it completely random? So try to figure out why did this happen at this time on this day? OSBI had, as I mentioned, had released a composite of a stranger that had been seen in the area. So I wanted to try to answer, is this a local or is this a stranger? Is this somebody that wandered off the interstate and came across the girls, which would make things more complicated? if this seemed to be a stranger, complete stranger murder, that would make it much more complicated. I wanted to try to answer what were the offender's characteristics? What were their personality traits? What were things that people that knew the offender would recognize in this offender? How do they appear to other people? How do they act toward other people? So these were the questions that I was looking to answer. The first thing that I thought was really important was to look at the victimology, developing a complete picture of Taylor and Skyla, the, the crime victims here. Could you explain why that's important? That's important because I want to see where their risks are. Is there something in their life that put them at risk for this kind of violent confrontation? Is there a person that they know or they've communicated with? Are they involved in high-risk behaviors that might put them here? Who are they communicating with? Do they have communication with strangers on the internet or online? Of course, this is back in 2008, so social media was much different back then, but there still were computers and internet and they had cell phones. So just kind of understanding what was their risk? That was really important to me because there are a lot of rumors going around. It's a small area. Not that the investigators were believing the rumors. There were a lot of people reporting things. Well, they came across a meth lab and so they were being murdered to keep them silent or they were informants. And as with any victims, when it's inexplicable, people come up with these wild ideas of how this could have happened. I really wanted to answer those questions. Are they high-risk victims? Are they low-risk victims? Were they targeted? Was this planned or was this random? Understanding who they were was really important. And I didn't have a good sense when the investigation came to me while it had been very thorough. I didn't have a good sense of who these girls were. What I asked investigators to do, I gave them a questionnaire and I asked them to give the questionnaire to people that knew the girls well, their family, friends, teachers, and then send them back to me so that I could find I, And I told them to be very honest and don't feel like if there's something negative that you have to report about them. I said, don't hold back. I need to know those things because that could help identify who the killer is. And so one of my former colleagues used to say is the more you know about your victim, the more you know about your offender. So I asked them not to hold back. Don't feel like you're blaming the victim if there's something that paints them in a negative light. And I think that can be hard for people because we really don't want to blame the victims. This is not what this is about. It's about understanding why they became a victim on that day at that time. And I think for the purpose of true crime podcast, learning more about the victim, I think, is acknowledging that this is a terrible crime that's occurred and that the people that we're talking about were real and were loved and were here and are no longer here. So I really would appreciate you telling us more about these two little girls. Sure. 
I'll start with Taylor. She was 13 years old, a little bit older, white female. She lived and was being raised by her grandparents. At the time of the murders, she had just completed the sixth grade. And I should say that this school combined grades. So fifth grade and sixth grade were combined because it was a small school. Even though Taylor had just finished sixth grade and Skyla had just finished fifth grade, they had been in class together. Taylor was an A student. And I want to remind everyone, they were killed near Taylor's house. They had stayed at Taylor's house over the weekend together. Skyla had been spending the night. So the crime scene is near Taylor's house. But anyway, Taylor was an A student. She was a cheerleader, typical middle school girl. She loved the film High School Musical. Her teachers and friends and family described her as being very smart. She was conscientious. She was sweet, respectful, quiet, and shy. And one thing about Taylor is she had been homeschooled up through fifth grade. So she was a little delayed socially in terms of she just hadn't come out of her shell yet. So she was pretty shy, but doing very well in school. One thing I learned about it, and of course, there were rumors that she was killed for revenge for something her family had done and things like that. But I didn't find anything like that. Her family was very supportive. They adored her. They were very involved in her academics, according to her teachers, and they would take her to school and pick her up. They just adored her. She did have access to the internet. She used it only to download music, play games, and do her homework through the school's website. She did not have any interactions online with anybody, any strangers that investigators could find. For fun, she liked to go for walks and explore the area around her home, and that was where they were going the day of the murder. They went from Taylor's home and they were walking toward an area, a bridge called Bad Creek Bridge. And they'd go down and they'd throw pebbles into the the water and they'd catch turtles and write their names on the backs of turtles. And this is something Taylor liked to do. And she would do this with her friends and she would explore the area also with her grandparents. Taylor had a cell phone, but the only calls were with her grandparents. And of course, I'm going to say she knew they were her grandparents, but she referred to them as her parents. She had lived with them from the time she was a baby. But those are the only calls. So she had absolutely any unknown contacts with anybody that would be considered inappropriate or older than her or anything like that. It was just with her grandparents Her social circle was just in the school through the classroom and through her activities as a cheerleader. There was no known use of alcohol or drugs. I know she's only 13, but some kids do get involved in drugs early. There was no sign of that. Taylor was extremely low risk, a low risk victim. And Skyla, while she was 11 years old, a a little younger, she's also a white female, She tended to be a little more outgoing than Taylor. And in fact, she was described as being very self-confident and very well-liked, very popular. She was athletic. She also participated in cheerleading and basketball. She loved animals and participated in the 4-H. She lived with her parents and a younger sibling. And as I mentioned earlier, she had just completed the fifth grade at the time of her murder. The murder was just a few days very shortly after they had finished the school year. So they were now starting the beginning of their summer break. And so Skyla had just finished the fifth grade. And while she was very involved in school activities, she was described as just an average student. So not the A student that Taylor was. And so they complemented each other very well. And they were the best of friends. Skyla did not have access to the internet at home at all, only at school or if she were at her friends' homes. And there was no indication that she was communicating with anybody on the computer or on the internet. She did not have her own cell phone, but she was allowed to use her parents' phone to call her friends if she asked permission. No indication that Skyla had ever dated anyone or ever used alcohol or drugs or anything like that. Separately, they would be assessed as being very low-risk victims. And then together, even with their activities together, they were considered low-risk victims. It wasn't like when they got together, they were out causing trouble or taking risks or anything like that. They were just very typical, sort of sheltered by their families who were very protective of them. 
just very low risk, whether they were independent of each other or together. Absolutely not someone that you would think would be found shot to death on the side of the road. No, not at all. And that made it even more perplexing. I don't know what I was expecting to find, but I thought something would jump out at me. Like one of them had contact with somebody on a cell phone or computer and met up with a stranger. But as I mentioned, the investigation had been so thorough and there was no indication at all. So that started to help me form potential motives and what led up to this. Interesting. I was thinking that the lack of risk would be perplexing, but you're saying that it helped you look at other reasons for the murders to have occurred. Well, I think what really started to form in my mind is that whatever the motive was, it wasn't due to delayed revenge or longstanding malice toward these girls. I, there just didn't seem to be anything in their lives that would indicate that. So it started to make me think that whatever the motive was, was formed on the road that day because there was no indications at all that they were meeting up with anyone, that they had planned to meet with anyone, that anyone knew their plans even. So I started to think, was this a random encounter? And whatever happened, happened that day. And then if you think about it, what on earth could these two girls do that would cause somebody to want to kill them? It was mind boggling to me. Like That really tells us a lot about an offender, that someone who could do this to these two girls, very low risk, very innocent, not causing trouble, who would do something like that. A picture started forming at that point in my head. But of course, there was more to do, more to look at. What about previous interviews and investigations? How deeply did you get involved in the files and going through what had already been done? I looked at everything they sent me, all the files, all the interviews. I read everything. There just wasn't anything that jumped out at me in terms of somebody having bad feelings about either of these girls. There just wasn't some of the stories that maybe people in the town or other kids told that were rumors they heard had been vetted by the investigators and proven to not be true. I really was just coming back to there just wasn't anything in terms of their lifestyle and their habits that would have put them at risk for this kind of violent confrontation. All right. So knowing that, how are you able to try to analyze who might have been responsible? What else does that tell you about the murderer? What does all the lack of all of that tell you? Well, it starts to tell me that maybe we're dealing with somebody who is impulsive or who overreacts. I don't know for sure, but one of the things I also wanted to take a good look at were the crime scene dynamics. What was the interaction between the offender or offenders and victims? And, and by doing that, not only giving me a better idea about an offender's personality traits and characteristics, but also trying to determine, is this one or two people that committed this crime? So utilizing like the crime scene photographs and the autopsy photographs and the autopsies and crime scene notes, they were so thorough that this was really had a lot of information to work with. And I wanted to piece back together what I thought had happened and what I determined. First, I'll go back to the crime scene. So the crime scene was about maybe a little under a thousand feet from the driveway of the Placker residence. So that's about how far that they had walked. And what had happened is they had gone for a walk on this afternoon between 4.30 and 4.45. Shortly after they left for the walk, Skyla's mother calls the Placker residence and tells them, I'm coming to get Skyla. So Taylor's grandfather goes to look for the girls, and this is where he, he discovers them. He discovers them on the side of the road. Taylor is on the side of the road. She's on her back and a little bit in a ditch, like her, her lower back is in a, in a shallow ditch. And Skyla is a few feet 
away from her in a grassy area, a little bit off the road, a few feet further back from the road. He finds them. There were obvious signs of potential gunshot wounds. That's how they're found. He screams back to Taylor's grandmother to call 911. She calls 911. And then the other thing that was noted is that there were five 40 caliber shell casings found on the road, and they were believed to have come from a Glock. So that's the scene. So looking at that and then piecing back together what the autopsies told us, Taylor had five separate gunshot wounds, two to the left side of her face, one on the right side of the face, one in her left groin, and one at the third right knuckle, which actually broke her finger. Skyla had eight separate gunshot wounds, one to the left neck, which ended up in her head, two in her right arm, one in the left shoulder, one in the left arm, two in the chest, and two in like the upper central area of her abdomen. The gunshot wound to her neck showed like minimal hemorrhages, according to the autopsy, indicating that that was probably inflicted after death, post-mortem. That was important. So I was trying to piece back together what I thought actually had happened. The lab results showed that the five forty caliber shell casings likely came from the same gun. The three bullets that were recovered from the victim's heads, when I say that two went into Taylor's face, they were, ended up in her head, and the one that was to Skyla's neck was, for all intents and purposes, a headshot because it did end up in her head. Those were from a different gun. They were 22 long rifle bullets, but the lab couldn't do any further identification on them. The other bullets were the 40 calibers and could not be identified or eliminated as coming from the same weapon. However, they did believe it was most likely a Glock. So we don't know for sure if there's only two weapons, but that was how investigators were leaning and medical personnel were leaning and I was as well. Knowing this, I thought we have to kind of piece back together what happened. And so what I thought happened, what the sequence of events were, is that the offender, he encounters the girls on the road. There was no indication that Taylor attempted to flee. So I believe the offender likely shot her first using the 40 caliber. It went into her right cheek and it passed through her hand. And I think she put up her hand to defend herself. I think the bullet fractured and part of it hit her cheek and created a mark and a burn mark on her cheek. And then it went into her face. And then I believe having seen this, Skyla turned to run. And that was why there was some distance between the girls. Not a lot. She didn't get very far. And then having witnessed her friend being shot, she apparently attempts to flee and is unable to make it very far when the offender shoots her multiple times. Once the girls are down, he goes back and he shoots Taylor in the groin region. I don't know why, but this is what he did. Following that, I believe the offender, again, I'm, I'm not certain why, I don't know if the gun malfunctioned or he went back into his vehicle, and I did believe he was in a vehicle, got a different weapon, and then came back and then shot them both at close range, essentially were their heads. These kind of coup de grace shots that were inflicted either very close to death or after death, ensuring that he had killed them. I guess every situation is different, but from my vast knowledge of reading crime novels and watching crime shows, because violent crime was not my area of expertise in the FBI, it just seems like coming back and shooting somebody in the head means something. One of my colleagues had made a comment at the time we were looking at this he was ensuring they did not get back to that house. I thought that was a good point. I didn't know why he was ensuring that, but I think that was it. He was ensuring that they were dead. And maybe because he didn't know for sure, maybe out of anger, maybe just for fun. I don't know why, but I believe it's probably just making sure 100% that they are not going to get back to the house and tell their families what happened between them, whatever happened. And at the time, I didn't know what it could be. And not only that, I just felt it was so methodical, cold-hearted. I mean, who could do that? That tells you a lot about the person's personality 
and their empathy or lack thereof. So just based on kind of probabilities and most likely sequence of events, I wasn't sure if this was 100%, but it was what I thought most likely happened based on the very thorough crime scene investigation, the very thorough autopsies that were very descriptive, and the crime scene notes that had been taken by investigators at the scene, they really helped me kind of piece this back together. So this really gave me a good idea. As you can see in that piecing back together, I really just felt like it was most likely just one offender. So I sort of answered that one question. And partially that goes to statistics. Statistically, if you have more than one victim, you still overwhelmingly only have one offender. And there was nothing that a killer could not have accomplished on their own. There wasn't anything that stood out that indicated had to be two offenders. Like, for example, there weren't two sets of footprints. There weren't bullets all in one victim and bullets all in another victim. It wasn't anything that had to have happened at the same time. So I just felt statistically, it's likely only one offender. Just based on kind of putting that back together, I felt like I answered that question to the best of my ability. The people that thought it was two offenders still believed it was two offenders, even after the analysis. But this is a product for them to use as they see fit. It's not like they have to take everything I say and do what I say. Not at all. Repeat why you thought, even though there were two different weapons, that there was only one offender. There was just nothing at the scene to indicate more than one offender. Overwhelmingly, if you have multiple victims, you statistically only have one offender. And since I didn't see anything at the crime scene that indicated that there had to be two, I kind of defaulted back to there's only one. I would have expected to see some simultaneous actions resulting in better control. The offender, for a brief period of time, lost control of Skyla. She was able to turn and run. He shoots Taylor. She's able to turn and run. And I think there would have been better control had there been two offenders there. So I just didn't really see anything that indicated to me that there had to be two offenders. So I really just went back to what we would see statistically. Yeah, that makes sense. I can see that. Were there any other things that you noted that were different than what people may have assumed? I think in terms of whether this person was local or not local, there were some investigators that thought that this person had to have been a stranger, came from the outside based on the composite sketch. Other investigators thought it had to be local. I thought it was probably somebody local, and I'll tell you why. I did visit the crime scene, and when investigators were driving me out there, I made a note to myself, like once we got off like the main road, the main interstate, made a note to myself, like try to pay attention to where we're going. Could you get out of here if you had to? That area is just a series of different dirt roads. And in fact, they don't even really have names. They have numbers. So you just have like a numbered road and you'd come to some intersection and it it all looked the same to me. And we took a lot of different turns. I'm sure it wasn't as confusing as it appeared, but when you've, we've only been there one time, it's very confusing. I'm like, I could not find my way out of here if I had to. So I just thought this has to be somebody that knows the area. They had a very short period of time to do what they did. And even though this was a Sunday afternoon, investigators had determined that cars on a Sunday afternoon would drive up and down this road about every five minutes. They did surveillance and determined that it's approximately every five minutes because on the weekends, this road was used as a cut through between towns and kids going to sports and sporting events. So it was busier on a weekend afternoon than it would be on a weekday to get out there, to commit the crime, and to get out of there in that short period of time, I would think you would have to probably know the area. And it's not just an area where somebody just wanders off the main road. It was about, this is an estimate, maybe three miles from the main interstate. That's just not somewhere somebody would just end up that didn't know the area. So again, just kind of going back to what was most likely is most likely someone very familiar with the area with a significant tie to the area. And I think some people felt like we've interviewed everybody. So he's not from here. And it's true. It was an exhaustive investigation. I think that was something else that maybe some people had disagreed with at the time. Kind of going back to motive what I described as a personal cause homicide. The person escalated directly to deadly force. There was no sign of a struggle. There was no known theft. 
there was no evidence of sexual assault and more likely some kind of reaction to whatever occurred on the road that day just prior to the murders, as I pointed out, rather than something that was delayed, retribution or revenge, or somebody had a lot of malice toward these victims, building malice, it just didn't see that. And there was just nothing in the girls' histories to suggest that they were at risk. So I just felt like this is some sort of personal cause. The motive was formed on the road that day in this very brief interaction. The violence was very controlled and deliberate. There was some debate of whether the offender could have walked to the crime scene, and I felt the offender likely had a vehicle because of their ability to get in and out of the crime scene quickly without being found. I mean, the girls were found relatively soon after leaving the house, and the family, the grandfather and grandmother, they didn't see anybody. People who had witnessed the girls walking on the road didn't see anybody either, so they got out of there pretty quickly. So I I felt like they were most likely in a car. This wasn't somebody running around. And we have to remember they at least had two weapons. And I thought it was most likely they were transporting their weapons in a car rather than carrying them at least two weapons and carrying them on their person up and down the road where they likely would have been seen. Those are some of the initial observations. And I know that you were invited. I mean, the locals actually asked the FBI agent that was working with them to invite behavioral analysis to come into the case. But was everyone on board? Were they ready to hear what you had to say? Were they ready to accept your conclusions? Everyone was on board. It was an extremely supportive environment and everyone was working very well together. In terms of accepting the conclusions, there were some people that didn't agree, and that's fine. That's always the case. I might be wrong. (laughs) This is not an exact science. So to me, I'm not offended if somebody doesn't agree. I understood why they had the viewpoints that they had. But in terms of just accepting and working, it was a great working environment with the Oklahoma State Bureau of Investigation and the local FBI office. I felt like it was a really good working environment. I learned a lot. We spent two full days immersed going out to the crime scene and sitting in a room and going over every piece of evidence and going over the crime scene and talking it through with them. I had so many questions as well. Every investigator I think that ever worked on it participated in this. They were all out at the crime scene. They were all part of the meetings. It was fantastic. You don't always get that kind of support, but it certainly was there in Oklahoma. And that brings up a good point because I forgot that you had the opportunity to actually go to the crime scene. How often does that occur? Does that occur in every case that is brought to the BAU? Do you normally just review the investigative file and conduct questionnaires? Or do most profilers have the opportunity to actually go out to the crime scene and to sit down with investigators? So time doesn't permit us to go to every crime scene, but certainly the higher the profile the case is, we would want to go. Certainly there are certain types of cases that you say to yourself, I need to see this for myself. There are other cases where you just realize, okay, I don't think I need to actually go to that crime scene. And in many cases, the cases are so old, the crime scene has been altered to such an extent it wouldn't do you any good to even visit. In this case, I was visiting the crime scene about the same time of year that the girls were killed, only three years later. Things had not changed very much, and I really did need to get a sense of what it was like out there. It was one of the cases I chose that I needed to go see the scene. If I had it my way, if a scene hasn't been altered, I would have liked to see every crime scene, but we just didn't have the luxury to do that or the time. So you kind of had to pick and choose which ones you felt it was most important. I do think that I probably could have done this without seeing the crime scene, but no matter what, you always learn something a little more. You get a better sense if you can actually visit. And it's unfortunate you don't have the time or the personnel to visit every single scene. I just thought of a question. You were talking about how close they were to Taylor's home. Nobody heard the gunshots? Some witnesses did report the gunshots, so the family did not hear the gunshots, but some people did report it. However, that is not unusual in this area. There's a lot of people out shooting their guns, there's hunters. So when people did hear gunshots or what they thought were gunshots, they were just disregarded it, didn't think anything of it. It's not an unusual sound. The other thing about the area is it's very muffled. 
when we went out there, I was walking down the middle of the road with one of the investigators. And it's a dirt road and there are trees and underbrush on either side. It's very wooded with an occasional home along the way that the homes are far apart. It's just a very rural area. So we're walking down the road and the investigator taps me on the arm to move me aside and I turn around and a car has come up right behind us. I didn't even hear it. And that was another thing that struck me, depending on where you are in location to certain sounds, you may not hear it because there is such a buffer and muffle from all the vegetation that was around. Really interesting. It was very interesting. And I was just surprised. Of course, I was very focused and not really necessarily paying attention (laughs) to a car coming by because we went out there. And this is a long stretch of road that you can see for a long ways. And I didn't really even think a car would come by. It seems so isolated. I was there on a weekday and we were out there for probably an hour and a half to two hours, just kind of walking up and down the road, getting a sense of the area. And we really saw just a couple cars. So on a work day, there's much less traffic than it had it been on a weekend. I think we saw two cars that came by. That's something that you don't get from a crime scene photograph, that you have to go experience that. So that made a lot of sense to me why maybe more people didn't hear gunshots, but there were reports, not unusual for this area. How long did you actually work on this case? So you started in January of 2011. When did you complete all of your analysis and write your report? And did you present it to the investigators in person? Yes. Probably about January is when I started to review the materials. You have to remember there are other cases that I'm also working on, so it wasn't a full time. But by the time I had reviewed all the case materials and was ready to travel out to Oklahoma, this I think I went out in May of that year. So several months. Of course, you have to make the travel arrangements and make sure all the investigators are available. So I went out in May and I was prepared by the end of our visit to provide them with the analysis, which we did at the end of our visit there. We gave them a verbal analysis and then I went back to the unit and wrote up everything I already told them. I do like to at least provide something to them verbally so they have notes and they can take notes on what I say and then follow up with a formalized report, which basically summarizes the investigation and the laboratory results and autopsy and then provides an area for my general observations and then an area for offender characteristics. All of that had been provided to them verbally as well. Now, I know we've talked a little bit as you've gone through your methodology, but can you now summarize some of the conclusions that you provided to them? Sure. I think I've already indicated most likely a male, and that's based on statistics at the time and that continue to exist today. So male offender, local, significant tie to the area, killed on a road that was almost exclusively used by the locals. So that backs up that theory. The person obviously comfortable with extreme violence. While I didn't think necessarily the offender had murdered before, he was so efficient, cool, calm, and collected. There was a preparedness to him engaging in this type of violent behavior. I felt that that would really be unexpected for someone who had never been violent before. I mean, we have to kind of go back and really think about what he did. He shot two girls multiple times and then went and got another gun and then shot them at close range in their heads. And I just thought that is somebody who's extremely comfortable with extreme violence and has likely been extremely violent in their past. And of course, not sure if he'd murdered before. There are no indications, at least in this area, that he'd ever killed before. But I felt like once they identified the offender, there were going to be stories about this particular offender, particularly with their interpersonal relationships with people. Certainly, whatever happened, the offender put his needs ahead of the victim's needs and had no regard for them. So I expected the offender to be someone who was very emotionally immature, selfish, manipulative in their interpersonal relationships, controlling. Those who know him would probably be very surprised by his reactions to things, very disproportionate to the situation. 
or he's perceived a slight that a person didn't mean and then they overreact. So I thought there would be these stories of this person really overreacting. So what I'm trying to do at this point is take what I've seen happen at the crime scene and say, what is this going to look like in this person's everyday life and their interactions and relationships that they have with people? What are you going to notice in this person? So I thought as you're investigating different suspects, you want to kind of find, are there anything like this in their background? Are people telling stories about this person like this? Oh, this person did this crazy thing and things like that. And I thought that that was going to be really evident once they identified the suspect. Certainly somebody who has no empathy whatsoever, just based on what he did. I don't know how you could have any kind of empathy. The other thing I said, which got a chuckle out of some of the investigators, I said the offender is familiar with firearms. They laughed. One of the investigators said to me something like, uh, this is Oklahoma, ma'am. We all have guns. We're all familiar with firearms. And to his point, I say, I know what you mean, but hear me out on this. And I, and I wasn't talking about somebody who was maybe a casual gun owner or somebody who was a hunter or somebody who carries it for personal protection. I thought this was somebody who was going to have like an obsessive relationship with guns. Somebody who brags and boasts about their ability to use a gun and probably practices, maybe even has threatened people before. This is somebody who practiced with guns. And the other thing that I said, what people will know about this offender. So if we go back to my theory that the motive was formed on the road that day, what I'm saying is the offender didn't necessarily plan to kill Taylor and Skyla, but yet he was prepared to kill them. So what does that tell us? He most likely is always carrying around guns with him. One could be a 22, one could potentially be a Glock. So this is a person that always has these guns with him and people that know the offender will know that he always has these guns with him and he will be obsessive about these guns. That was my theory. And they, they kind of understood once I explained it more. It is Oklahoma. And having grown up in a small town myself where it was there were a lot of avid hunters in this, I wasn't talking about people that carry around hunting rifles in the gun racks in their trucks that enjoy hunting for sport. I was talking about somebody who was much more obsessive and dangerous when it came to their relationship with firearms. So that was my profile at the time. That was what I gave verbally. And then I wrote up a report and sent it to them with the same information in it. Now, after you submit that report, then I take it that unless they get back to you or you hear something additional, your work on that particular case is done? Usually, yes. Yeah. Sometimes if it's an ongoing investigation, investigators will reach out and like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And, and I did have that kind of relationship with these investigators. They were running by ideas. There was somebody at the time that I gave the profile that really kind of fit pretty well in terms of the one thing that was a little bit off was the age. This person was much, much older than what investigators thought. And I would say, well, it's not necessarily about their chronological age. It's about their emotional age. But investigators really felt like he's just too old to be our guy. But there was somebody who was sort of fitting in some of the aspects, but not all of them. They were calling me and we were discussing that particular person and a potential interview of them. But during that time, and it was just a few months after I had been out there, I got a call from the FBI agent who said that the OSBI has just arrested an individual who they believe has murdered his fiance. And the OSBI investigator interviewed him and came out and said he fits the profile of the Walika murder. And so they called me about this saying, this guy fits the profile. I was stunned and a little skeptical. Why were you skeptical? First of all, it was just a few short months after. Usually, like you pointed out, you do a profile and sometimes you don't hear anything and you don't expect to hear anything right away. It could be years and years and sometimes you never hear anything. And, and we had been discussing other potential investigative strategies and things. So I was just stunned that in such a short period of time, they developed what they thought was a really good suspect. And I was a little concerned, I guess, because I was glad that they had paid attention to the profile, but I was also concerned that maybe there was some confirmation bias going on, that maybe they were seeing what they wanted to see. Like this person has just done something very awful. He has murdered his fiance, who was a wonderful young woman herself, Ashley Taylor. She was 23 years old. And I thought, he's done something so bad here. Are they seeing those same characteristics? 
I guess I was just a little bit skeptical, but also knowing that these are very good investigators that weren't impulsive or jumping to conclusions. And so I kind of waited to hear as things started to develop. And sure enough, he really did seem to match the profile. And his name is Kevin Sweat. He had been engaged to this young woman, Ashley Taylor. Ashley, in July of 2011, had told her family that she and Kevin were going to go elope. And then she disappeared. They couldn't get a hold of her. Ultimately, in August, they arrested Kevin and charged him with murdering her, basically because he didn't want to get married to her. Did they find the body? They did. They found her body on his father's property, which was near the crime scene. So that was one of the things, like his dad lives near the crime scene. He uses that road to go from one town to another. I remember the FBI agent telling me that when the OSBI investigator was interviewing him, he just kept saying he has no feeling, like this lack of empathy. There's just something, he kept saying there's something about him. He matches the profile. He's what I would think. But other things besides gut instinct started to percolate his tie to the area. The other thing that ended up being the key was on his father's property, there was a makeshift firing range where he had practiced and they found shell casings and the shell casings on his father's property matched the shell casings at the crime scene. They had some good forensic evidence tying Kevin to this crime scene. The other thing And I think this was the moment for me where I'm like, this is him. This has got to be him. This is exactly what I was saying. But he had posted, he had taken pictures of himself and he had posted pictures online of himself posing with his guns. He was known to be very obsessive with his guns. When I saw the pictures of him, I'm like, that's what I was talking about when I said this is somebody obsessive about guns. And there was other information coming in from other people he had known or dated Even though he was engaged to be married, he was seeing other girls. One woman reported that she tried to break up with him on the phone and he said he was going to kill himself and he shoots his gun and she thinks that he's killed himself while on the phone with her and she starts screaming as you can imagine how traumatizing that could be. Then he gets back on the phone and starts laughing and says, what's your problem? So these kinds of stories, and when I was talking about these disproportionate reaction and these things that can be shocking and this manipulating behavior, and certainly when you're trying to describe someone like that, you can't describe a specific instance just like this. When you hear a story like that, which is horrifying, you're like, yep, this is the kind of person that could do this to these girls. So this all started to kind of come in. And of course, the shell casing match was key forensically, tying him to that. So the next thing was to attempt to interview him about the murders of Taylor and Skyla. And so we helped prepare an interview strategy for Kevin as well. Talk a little bit about that. What do you mean by interview strategy? We want to give the investigators the best opportunity to elicit information. Like, how are you going to approach this person and get as much information out of him as possible? What's the best way to do that? That's like knowing about him and understanding him. And of course, there was just a bunch of information coming in about him. And one of the things that I had the opportunity to do as well is listen to his phone calls while he was in jail. So I was learning a lot about him. And one of the things that really struck me in terms of his personality, not only with what I'd already developed just by looking at the crime scene before I even knew who he was, but what we were learning about him, but these phone calls also told me something. But at some point, he's on the phone with his mother. His mother tells him that he might be charged with the murder of the girls, Taylor and Skyla. And his response to his mother is, what is that going to do to my reputation? I just thought, there you go. Reputation. That's important to him. That's a key factor. And there were other little nuggets of things that I could tell that were important to him. In terms of the strategy, the investigator that had originally interviewed him about him murdering his fiance, I, I felt they should stick with that same investigator. He'd done a very good job. Kevin had talked to him and confessed to him. It wasn't a perfect confession because he did lie and he said some things that were implausible that couldn't have happened, some magical thinking. And and I think he was trying to maybe try to set up an insanity defense, but I felt like they still had a good rapport and it should be the same investigator. Is that the whole thing about monsters? 
Yeah, well, he, so that was what he said in his confession to Taylor and Skyla. And I can't recall exactly when he was talking about when he killed Taylor, but there was something about her, I think, coming back to life at some point. It is something that just could not have happened. I'm like, okay, he has this kind of magical thinking. Maybe he's trying to set up that he's insane. Like he's not responsible for his actions because he sees things and he's not really killing her. He's killing a monster. And that's what he ended up telling the investigator when it came to Taylor and Skyla. He said that he was driving down the road and pulled over to take a leak. And then all of a sudden he saw these monsters coming at him. And so he had to shoot and kill the monsters. He had taken the gun from between the seats of his vehicle. And then he got back in the car and the monsters started coming at him again. So he had to get another gun out of his glove box and then he had to shoot them again. As you can see, he's putting himself there. He's confessing to the crime, but he's also making it seem like he's not responsible because he was seeing things and these were monsters and he had to kill these monsters. And ultimately he was ruled sane, that he was competent to stand trial. In my opinion, this was all just malingering. It wasn't real. But I really felt like when he went in to talk with Kevin that he had to tell him, we have irrefutable evidence that you've killed Taylor and Skylet. So I didn't want to leave it open open to debating whether or not they had enough information. It would just deteriorate into potentially an argument and maybe Kevin would shut down. So I was like, don't allow him to deny it. Just tell him the case is very strong and you just really want to know the why. And that's the story he told. And while it wasn't a perfect confession, again, it put him on the road that day. He admits to killing them. The other thing that really struck me is that he got the sequence of events right in what I thought had happened. So to me, that was credible. I didn't feel this was a false confession. I felt this was a true confession. It just wasn't a perfect confession. Certainly, investigators and prosecutors felt that it was a good confession. So that was the story that he told. Ultimately, he was also charged in December of 2011 with the murders of Taylor and Skyla. So did we ever get to find out if there was another reason more? I mean, it's never rational to kill children, but was there something more rational in his mind that led to the murders? Did we ever get to find out what that was? Not from him. He's never stated the real reason or what really happened other than this monster story. But I have a theory and it's speculation. My theory is when he did confess about being on the road, he said he pulled over to take a leak and then the monsters just came at him. Well, having been on that road, he could have seen the girls coming from a long ways away. It wasn't like they just came around the corner and caught him. My opinion is what he's actually admitting to, he's admitting that he exposed himself. So that's what I think happened is that he saw them, maybe stopped his car, got out, exposed himself to them. I don't know if perhaps one of them recognized him. Maybe Taylor recognized him or they told him that they were going to tell on him. Or maybe he realized after doing so, they were going to tell on him no matter what. And I believe that's the motive he killed them. I, I believe it was witness elimination. So there's a sexual component to the murder. It's not a sexually motivated murder. That is my theory, just based on what he told investigators, what he was doing that day. I don't know if that is the case, but that is my best theory. And I know that it seems so far-fetched that somebody would do this to two girls just for that reason, just because they might get in trouble for exposing himself. But you have to remember that this is a person that when he was told he was going to be charged with their murder was concerned about his reputation. This is a person who, when a girl tried to break up with him on the phone, pretended that he killed himself and then laughed at her for her reaction. This is somebody that I think is very capable of murder for this very seemingly minor reason and motive. That's my theory. Yeah, how horrifying for the families. It just seemed so minor and ridiculous that those girls died because somebody was afraid that they would tell and he would be embarrassed. Yeah, and whatever the reason was, Jerry, whether it falls in line with my theory, whatever it is minor, I know that it's minor. There is nothing that these girls did to him that would have caused this kind of reaction. This is an overreaction on his part. This is who he is. He's an extremely, extremely dangerous person. 
In fact, before sentencing, he had attacked his own attorney with a razor blade and slit his neck. I mean, it was a life-threatening injury. I mean, he didn't die, but that's how dangerous he is. And he would have gone on to kill again. I, I have no doubts about that, just based on how easy it was for him and for what I believe most minor reasons. I think the victimology tells us that about these girls. There's absolutely no reason. There's never really a reason, but in this particular case, the victimology really tells us everything we need to know about the offender. I'm just sitting here kind of sad that there are mm -hmm. people out there like him that can take a life without even thinking about it. It's terrifying. It really is. And we talked about this on our show a little while back. And one of my colleagues was saying sometimes that's the draw of true crime, understanding these stories. How can someone do this? Us seemingly normal people, hopefully trying to understand how this can happen. And that's why we're drawn to these cases. And this particular case will stick with me the rest of my life. My career is over now in terms of the FBI. And obviously, I, I worked on it many, many years ago, but I have never forgotten it. I never will. It impacted me that much. It was terrible, but also extremely rewarding to see the investigators bring closure to this case and resolve it in the way that they did. Thank God that they were able to do that. It probably saved many other lives. Well, I know that Kevin Sweat pled guilty and there was no need for a trial. What kind of sentence did he receive? Three life sentences for the murders of the two girls and his fiancee. In Oklahoma, does that mean he'll never get out of prison? I don't believe he ever will. And when he was sentenced, I believe the onlookers applauded. They applauded the sentencing. So I, I don't think he's ever going to get out. All right, good. Because I know for some state sentencings, just because you get a life sentence doesn't necessarily mean you're in there forever. So that's good to know. Right. He'll be in there forever, I hope. Well, I want to thank you for reviewing this case. I like to ask all of my guests when and why they joined the FBI. We have already talked about that in the episode that we did on the Golden State Killer, which was 242. So I'm not going to ask you that again. I'll invite listeners to go listen to that episode to learn about how you got into the FBI. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking more again about your podcast, The Consult. You mentioned this a little bit about your being drawn to true crime, but why you decided to do a podcast. You were a big inspiration, by the way. Thank you. So I finished my career in the Boston division. I ended up coming back up from headquarters and finishing my career. And I would tell stories to younger people on my squad and they're like, oh, you should do a podcast. One of the newer agents did ask if I had ever heard of your podcast. And at the time I had not. And I'm like, no, tell me about it. He's like, oh, you would love it. He listened to it before he even became an agent. I listened to your podcast and I thought, oh, I, that would be something I would really like to do in a different way, sort of, you know, like you're trying to demystify the FBI in general. I'm trying to demystify what profiling is and what it can and can't do, its strengths, its limitations. And it's a way for me to continue to do the work that I love with the people that I loved to work with. Certainly, it's a little different doing the podcast. We cover solved cases because I think listeners like to hear about the process and what worked with the process, what didn't work. They like to have the conclusion, but we've also covered some unsolved cases and I'm going to continue to do that because I find those most rewarding. It's a way I feel like maybe some way we can help keep a case in a spotlight. Maybe information will get to somebody and they didn't even realize that they had information and they'll come forward. Some of the cases that we've covered, people have thought they were already solved and they come to realize, oh, wait, this case wasn't solved. And so and keeping these cases highlighted and I just find it very rewarding. That is why I did the podcast. All right. And then not to put you on the spot, but when are you writing your book? <laughs> 
I have not planned to write a book. I think about it sometimes. I don't know what I would write about, but I mean, certainly you're an inspiration in that category as well. So I think about fiction sometimes, like, oh, we could come do a fiction book based on a compilation of the different stories that I have to tell from my career. Pulling bits and pieces from different aspects of cases would be fun, but I don't know if I'll ever get around to it. Well, I know for people who have been trained and have spent time in the FBI's Behavioral Analysis Unit, BAU, must get frustrated, especially those who work in the unit that had to deal with serial killers and serial murders. They had to get kind of frustrated in all the movies and books and TV shows that talk about profilers and have profilers deep into the investigation actually chasing down the serial killers and things like that. But I've come to understand that it's almost its own genre. It's almost like whether you're writing romance or writing fantasy, serial killer books and movies and TV shows are their own genre. And there's nothing Mm -hmm. that we could do to kind of pull people back to the reality of what really occurs. Right. I thought the job was fascinating and exciting, even though it's not at all like it is on TV. It's a real desk job. You're going through paperwork. You're not conducting interrogations the way you see on the TV shows. I mean, you're providing a service to the people that are doing the investigations. So you're not involved in the investigation, nor should you be, because you have to stand back and be unbiased and you need to look at the big picture. I don't know that it would be exciting to really portray it on TV as it is, but I did find it to be one of the most exciting jobs and it's extremely interesting to me. But I think too, to demystify, there are some people that think profiling is the be all end all. Oh, the profiler said this, so it must be true. And there are other people that think it's not helpful at all, that it's useless, that it's junk science. And I like to point out, it's just somewhere in between that. And that's what our show is about, like just showing the in-between, what we can do, what we can say, what we can't say, and how it works, how the process works, so that people have a, a better understanding of it, particularly in real cases where maybe the FBI's BAU has provided assistance or service. I see that a lot. Oh, the BAU said this, the BAU said that. What does that exactly mean? What would BAU assistance look like if they really were involved in a certain case? That's what we want to try to demystify. I think you are doing an excellent job in that effort. (laughs) Thank you, Jerry. That means a lot. All right. So we're at the end and I'd love for you to have the last word. So what would you like to say? I have two things I'd like to say. First of all, if anyone is going to go check out our podcast, I'd like to point them to two cases. They're both several episodes. They're unsolved. If you're going to listen to anything, I would want you to listen to the unsolved case. One of them is the murder of Philip Martino, who was murdered in San Francisco in August of 2010. That case remains unsolved. And if you know anything, please call the San Francisco Police Department. So Take a listen to that one. And the other case is the abduction of Jody Husentrout, who was abducted in June of 1995. She was a Iowa news anchor in Mason City, Iowa, and she was rushing to get to work early morning and she was abducted and she's never been found, although her family has declared her deceased, her body has never been found. I'd like to just point listeners to either of those two cases. And of course, if they have any information, please contact the local agencies. Those are in the show notes. Both those cases are very near and dear to me. The last thing I'd like to say is I'd like to thank you, Jerry, for not only being an inspiration to me for my podcast, but for all your support these years in doing my podcast. I really appreciate this network that we have with other creators that are very supportive of one another. I just want to thank you for that. You are the biggest cheerleader and the biggest inspiration. So thank you so much. None of us would be here without people who inspire us. And I wouldn't have done the podcast had you not had a podcast and your continued support. I'm sure of that. So thank you. And that's the end of the interview. 
In your podcast app's description of this episode, there's a link to the show notes at jerrywilliams.com where you'll find a photo of Julia Cowley, case-related images and links to articles about the Walika schoolgirl murders investigation. There's also a link to Julia's other FBI retired case file review episode 242 and links to other episodes about FBI profilers and the FBI's behavioral analysis unit. Don't forget to check out the link for my FBI Retired Case File Review live event in Philadelphia on Sunday, April the 28th, 2024. I hope you enjoyed the interview and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. You can show me just how much you liked it by buying me a coffee. There's a link in your podcast app's description of this episode, or you can visit jerrywilliams.com and tap on the little coffee cup icon in the bottom right-hand corner of my website. Don't forget to follow FBI Retired Case File Review on your favorite podcast app. Now, this podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, Once a month, via my reader team email, I keep you up to date on the FBI and books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, a colorful list of more than 70 books about the FBI written by FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoirs. You'll also get my FBI reality checklist, where I debunk 20 cliches about the FBI and receive news about what I'm up to and about my FBI nonfiction and crime fiction books. I want to thank you for listening to the very end. I hope you come back for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.